What's it doing that for? No, I don't, I don't want that. I want... No, off. No, turn that... No, turn that bloody thing off. to Jason's Macintosh Museum. I'm Jason, your host, and today we're going to continue our video series on problems you encounter with old Apple Macintosh computers. And specifically for this video, we're talking about these things, hard disks. Now, since I started working with old Apple Macintosh computers back in the, uh, well, it'll be the late 1990s, in fact, probably after bad capacitors, the most common problem I experience with these old Apple Macs is failing hard disks. But that's nothing, of course, specific to the Apple Macintosh. Every old computer that uses a physical hard disk will have problems with it, simply because the hard disk is a mechanical device. Because if you think about all the parts inside an old computer, um, well, even a, even a modern computer for that matter, basically they're all solid state. In other words, they're electronics that don't have any moving parts. The only part in any computer system, really apart from, say, the floppy disk drive, if it has one, that has moving parts is the hard disk. Because, of course, inside a hard disk, you have platters that spin, you have heads that move in and out. A lot of things can go wrong. Now, with a modern PC, of course, if the hard disk fails, it's quite easy to replace it. You simply go and buy a new one, whether it's um, SATA or, um, or SAS or, or what have you. But of course, modern machines also have SSD drives, which are far less likely to fail. But the fact is they're easy to, to replace. But on an old Apple Macintosh, if you need a replacement hard disk, your options are somewhat limited, simply because of the type of drive that they used at the time. I've got some examples here. These are all hard disks that came out of old Apple Macintosh systems um, sometime around the late 1980s and early 1990s. And these drives were typical of drives that Apple used throughout the, really from the, the mid 1980s all the way through until the mid to late 1990s. In particular, these are SCSI. Now, if you've been around old Apple Macintosh systems, you'll be familiar with SCSI. SCSI stands for Small Computer System Interface. It's basically a data bus or data transfer interface that was developed for use not just with um, hard disks, in fact, it was, it was developed for, for use with all types of data storage devices, whether it's um, hard disks, um, tape backup drives, um, even um, some scanners, in fact, used um, SCSI. And the beauty of SCSI is that it's, it's the ability for it to support multiple devices on a single physical bus. In other words, with SCSI you can have up to, I think it's about 16 devices on a single bus and you can connect them all together with one device connecting to the, the, ne the next and the next and the next in a sort of daisy chain. So it's a system that works very, very well and Apple used SCSI for a very, very long time. In fact, they used SCSI ever since the Macintosh Plus of 1986. That was the very first Macintosh to have a SCSI port. The idea was that you could hook up a hard drive to it. That was the, the primary reason for it. And they used SCSI as their um, disk interface of choice exclusively up until around 1994 when they started using IDE, in other words, the, the PC standard, for their disks. Although those machines still had SCSI ports, you could still connect external SCSI devices to them. And they used it right up until I think the early 2000s when they finally um, removed SCSI completely in favor of SATA or standard IDE. Now, at the time, Apple chose SCSI mainly because of its performance. Because back in the 1980s, um, PCs, for example, that had hard disks um, really had to use either the MFM or RLL drive controller system. And the performance or the data transfer rate on that system between the drive and the host system was quite poor. SCSI, on the other hand, performed a lot better. 
And what that enabled Apple to do is take advantage of fast disks that came out in the late 80s and 1990s. And it's one of the reasons why um, Macintosh systems performed so well compared to the PC compatibles um, or PC systems that ran at the time. Because even when the PC moved to the ID or integrated drive electronics standard, the data transfer rate was still quite poor, really up until the mid 90s when Ultra DMA or DMA Mode 2 was, was more or less universal. So at the time, SCSI made sense. It was a fast system and it also enabled you to hook up many other devices such as tape backup drives, external CD-ROM drives, scanners, all sorts of things. So it was very, very useful. And as I mentioned, basically every Macintosh since the 1986 Macintosh Plus all the way through to I think it was the I think it could have been one of the G3 models. Every single Macintosh between those two um, had a SCSI port of some description. Of course, the laptops you had to use an adapter, but every desktop Macintosh did have one. So, what does that mean for, for you now? Well, what it means is that if you have an old Macintosh with a SCSI hard disk and the disk starts to fail, it's going to be very tricky to get hold of a replacement simply because the disks are not being made anymore. Nowadays, SCSI hard disks are really, well, they're not, even, even for servers, they're not really very, um, very popular. Um, normally, um, servers will actually use SATA or sometimes SAS, which is serial attached SCSI, but those disks are completely different and the interface is completely different to what the old Apple Macintosh systems used. These drives are a good example. These drives use what's called parallel SCSI or narrow SCSI. It uses a 50 pin connector between the drive and the controller. And that type of SCSI has not been in use, well, I'd say for at least for the last um, 10 years or so. So the drives are not being made anymore. So if you're trying to um, work with an old Apple Macintosh, what does all this mean? Well, it means that if you have a Macintosh with a SCSI hard disk and the disk um, fails, then you may have a bit of an issue finding a replacement, simply because the drives are not being made anymore. Now, SCSI drives are still being made, but they're being made in a format called Serial Attached SCSI, or SAS, and that's mainly used for high-end servers. But it's a totally different system from the SCSI bus that was used by Apple back in the 80s and 90s. Serial Attached SCSI uses a serial communication line between the drive and the host system. And that's actually why on a, um, on a SAS drive there are only, I think, about four or six pins on the data connector. Because data is sent serially between the drive and the host controller. Now, back in the days of the SCSI Mac machines in the 80s and 90s, parallel SCSI was the standard and that's what these drives use. Unfortunately, drives that support parallel SCSI are simply not being made anymore. No system uses them. So what do you do? Now, one of the things you can try, which I haven't tried myself, admittedly, is a SCSI to IDE converter, which you can buy. And that will enable you to use a IDE drive, or even a SATA drive, I think they exist, um, the converters, on a SCSI controller. Now, I don't know how much these adapters cost or how widely available they are, but I personally am a little bit skeptical of using a converter like that because I just don't see that it would, be, it would work reliably, especially on an old Macintosh with an old SCSI controller. So your other option is to find a second-hand SCSI hard disk. Again, not easy, not easy to find one, especially one that's actually in working condition. Um, unless you can also um, get hold of another Mac just to get the drive, which I know um, some people do. So apart from using a converter or getting hold of a second-hand replacement drive in working order, you also um, have the option of trying to repair the drive you currently have, and that's really the focus of this particular video. Because I found that over the years working on these old Apple Macs, 
I've seen drives fail for any number of reasons, some of which are, can be fixed, some of which cannot. Now I want to make clear at this point that if you have a drive that will work and but it has issues reading certain parts of the disk, you have bad sectors here and there, there's not much you can really do in order to fix that. That indicates that the drives, um, that the actual magnetic media inside the drive is starting to fail and it's just a matter of time before the drive becomes totally unusable. So in that situation you really have no choice but to get rid of the drive. However, there are other modes of failure that these drives can have where you can in fact fix them. So the idea of this video is to give um, any of you who are working on an old Apple Macintosh with a bad hard disk some, some tips on ways that you might be able to get the drive working again. And I'm really going to, I'm, I'm going to split the problems these drives have up into three particular um, categories. First problem is if the drive doesn't power on at all. In other words, you turn the power on and nothing happens. The drive doesn't do anything, it doesn't make any sound, it doesn't spin up, nothing. That's issue number one. Issue number two is where the drive will, you'll hear the drive spin up, but it won't complete its self-test and it won't, and, and you can't access the disk. In other words, you'll hear the platter spin up, but you won't hear the heads moving back and forth. Problem number two. Issue number three is where the drive will power on. You'll hear the heads moving back and forth as it does the self-test, but the Macintosh cannot see the disk. It doesn't, it doesn't come up as being recognized. <clears throat> So they're basically the three issues that I want to tackle in this video. And as part of that, I'm going to actually take apart one of the disks that you see here, this quantum right here, in order to try and fix a very common problem that affects this particular variant of quantum drive that Apple used in many, many of their systems back in the 1990s. So let's get started. Okay, so let's tackle the first issue you may encounter with an old SCSI hard disk. Let's say you have a machine that when you turn the power on, the drive does nothing. It doesn't spin up, doesn't make any noise, nothing happens at all. Now, there could be several reasons for that, um, but the very first thing that I would check is just to make sure the drive's actually getting power, because you would be surprised that I've seen systems that will start up and run, but for some reason the power connector for the drive isn't getting the correct voltage. And of course, if the drive's not getting the correct voltage, it will not spin up. So to show you what I mean, I have a machine set up here. I have a Macintosh LC475 that I'm using as a test. And I want to show you how you can check that the drive is actually getting the correct power. So let me get all the cables hooked up and we'll, we'll zoom in and we'll have a closer look at that. Okay, so here we have the machine set up um, just, to, just to test with. and. Let's say we turn the machine on and we hear it boot, but we don't hear anything from the drive. Now, this drive does work, so if I turn the machine on, hopefully you can hear the drive start up there. So this drive is actually working correctly, but let's suppose that we hear the system chime, the fan comes on, but the drive does nothing. Well, obviously, we need to check the connections first. So, obviously, you want to make sure that the... Whoops, and the camera moved. Ah. <laughs> Let's just reposition that. <clears throat> so, you want to make sure that the drive is, in fact, plugged in. In other words, the connector on the drive is correctly seated. And focus. This bloody camera. <laughs> and also that the connector to the logic board is also, or power supply is correctly seated as well. Now, if you find the drive does not respond even when you do all of that, you should actually check the voltage being supplied to the plug. So to do that, just turn this off, what you would do is get a, uh, get a multimeter that can read DC volts and take your power plug from the drive, and you can see that these are what's known as a Molex power connector. They have four pins, two, the two in the middle are ground, and then we have an orange and a red. Now the orange 
should be a 12 volt supply, this one, and the red should be a 5 volt supply. So all you do is take your multimeter, put it onto the DC volts scale, well DC volt setting, you leave it on auto range, uh, it's, norm it's normally fine if you leave it on auto ranging, and just probe the negative lead on one of the centre pins and we'll start by probing the the red connector. Now I should mention though, it's important, if your multimeter has very fat pins, don't try and force them in through the front of the connector because you may spread the terminals apart. This one slips in nicely so it isn't actually going to damage the connector. It's just the right size to slip in without spreading the pins apart. But just probe in the end here. So this one we're probing the orange lead. So we should have 12 volts when we turn the system on. So you can see we've got 12.2 volts, 12.3 volts on that. So that's fine. Now if we move across to the red pin, just I'll actually probably I'll probably back probe the connector for the red pin just to make sure I don't screw anything up. There we go. And you can see we have 5 volts on that. So at this point we know that the power supply is putting out the correct voltage for the drive to operate. So we've eliminated that as a possibility. Now the next cause of a drive that will not respond when the power is applied is actually a very, very common issue with old hard disks and it's called stiction, which is really a combination of the words stick and friction. Now, to understand what stiction is, we need to look inside a hard disk. So I've taken the lid off this one. This drive doesn't work, so uh, I'm able to take it apart. And inside the drive, you can see that we have the platters up the top here, which actually spin when the drive is operating. And we have the heads here that you can see that are on this arm that moves back and forth across the disk in order to access the, the data. So normally, in a disk that's functioning, when you turn the power on, these platters will start to spin up to their rated speed. It's normally on these old drives about 3600 RPM, or the new ones maybe 5400 RPM. And then when the drive, when the platters have reached their speed, the heads will then move from their park position, which is where they are here, and they'll move across the disk in a set pattern to calibrate themselves. And at that point, the drive is ready for use. Now, you'll notice that when the drive is running, well, you, you may not notice, but, but the fact is when the drive is running, the heads don't actually touch the surface of the platters. They're designed to hover due to air pressure they're designed to hover a very small um, distance, I mean, we're talking fractions, fractions of a millimetre, above the surface of the disc. So they basically fly over the surface because once the drive spins up, once the platters spin up, it generates enough of, enough um, really aerodynamic lift that it actually forces the heads to move slightly away from, from the disc. So, in normal use, there should never be any contact between the heads and the disc material. However, when the drive is off, the heads have to settle down on the disc in their park position. So what will happen is that when the drive loses power, the heads will automatically return to, the head, to their park position, which is normally in the center of the disc as far as they can go, and then as the platter spins down, the heads slowly come to rest on the surface of the disc. At that point, they're parked. Now that's fine, but what can happen on older drives, especially those that haven't been powered on for a long time, is that as the drive sits in its powered off state, the heads can actually stick to the surface of the platter. And so when you try and turn on the power, the friction between the platter and the head 
is so great that the, 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 the torque of the, of the motor that drives the platters can't overcome that and the disc can't spin. So what you'll have is a drive that when it gets power won't do anything because the motor is trying to spin the platters but because the heads are stuck to the surface it won't let the platters turn and that's what's known as stiction and as I mentioned on drives um, on older drives especially those that don't get used very often it's quite a common problem however there is quite well there's usually quite an easy solution which does involve a little bit of brute force so if you think that the drive you are trying to fix has stiction all you have to do is um, you don't have to take the drive apart or anything like that but all you have to do I'll use this one here as an example is just after you turn the power on give the drive preferably with something maybe a plastic head of a screwdriver like this give it a sharp tap just after you turn the power on and often what you'll find is that that is enough to free the bond between, or well, the temporary uh, bond, between the platters and the head. And because you're doing this with the motor on, then as soon as that bond is broken, the motor can get the platters spinning. And once they start to spin, the drive can power up. So literally, it was, it's just a question of giving it a sharp tap um, on the top of the drive, or several taps in sequence. Obviously you don't want to hit it too hard because you can damage the drive, but just a couple of sharp taps on the top of the drive um, will, will often solve the problem. And then if you hear the drive spin up, then everything is okay. However, I do find that some drives that have stiction issues, you can get them going by doing this, but then the next time you power the drive off, the heads will stick again. So you may have to uh, give it a few, uh, few taps every time you try to, to start it. And there's really no permanent fix for stiction, um, short of replacing the drive. There, there's, no, there's no adjustment or fix you can make to prevent it from happening. It simply happens due to the drive's age. So, the other fix for stiction that I've sometimes had to do on drives is to use the inertia of the platters themselves to free them from the heads. Now what I mean by that is, I'll just put the cover back on this, uh, back on this disc here, I'll just zoom out. Sometimes giving it a sharp tap is not enough. What you have to do is actually grab the drive and twist it along, around its axis of rotation like this, back and forth, well, don't hit it, <laughs> back and forth a couple of times like that. And by doing that, because the platters are at rest, they will have a tendency to stay at rest even when the drive's housing is rotated quickly. And in, in, by doing this, you're, in a sense, you're moving the drive and the heads relative to the platters because of, their, because of the platters' inertia. So sometimes by doing that and then connecting the drive back up, it will start up. I've had, that, I've had success with that on a few drives. Now, if you find that even after um, tapping the drive and giving it a shake like that, that it still won't spin up, you may, have a, you may have a stiction issue that is so severe that you will actually have to open the drive up and physically turn the platters in order to get the drive freed up. Now, of course, I don't recommend opening a drive up unless you absolutely have to, because obviously dust and contaminants can get into the, into the case. But for an old Apple Macintosh with an old SCSI drive, I think it's certainly worth a shot. So what you would do is simply take the cover off the drive, as I've done here, and you would simply, very carefully, try and spin the platters. If you find they're stuck, then very carefully apply enough twisting force to break them loose from the heads. Once the platter is spinning freely, you can then put the cover back on the drive and try and power it on. Now, so those are the, the key reasons why a hard disk won't spin up or show any signs of life. But what I want to talk about now is another problem that I'm seeing on certain models of drive that Apple used. 
and the problem manifests itself as a drive that will spin up. You'll hear the platters spin up, but the heads won't move across the disc to do their self-test, and the drive will then power itself off automatically. Now, this has to do with the way the heads park, and I'll, uh, I'll explain that a bit, in a bit more detail. Okay, so if you have a drive that will spin up and then spins down again after a few seconds, that's normally a, an issue caused by the drive not being able to move the heads to do their to, to perform the self-test. Because when a drive normally spins up and powers on, it will, it will spin the platter up and then it will, it will get the drive's platters running at the correct speed. Once that happens, the heads will start to move across the disc in various steps. In fact, I'll try and simulate that if I power this LC475 on with this drive and I'll show you what the drive actually does. Okay, so I'm going to try and power this drive on with the cover off, just so you can see that how the drive powers up normally. Now what should happen is the platter should start to spin, and then the heads will move back and forth to calibrate themselves. So let's see what it does. Okay, so you can see there that the, the drive powered on and the heads moved across the disc. So that's how the drive should function. And notice that when I turn the power off, the heads will move... <laughs> okay, that, uh, this drive is, uh, is not happy. <laughs> but at least I've, able, I've been able to show the correct startup sequence for, a, for the drive. But Basically, as I, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, when the drive is powered off, then the heads will move. The heads will move into the middle of the disc. Now, we have an actuator down below, which is known as a voice coil actuator. It's this unit right here. And inside, you have a coil of what... Well, many coils of wire wrapped around an arm that's um, just under here and then you have permanent oops <laughs> as I was saying you have permanent magnets which is why you've got to be careful with this because they'll be it'll be attracted to them you have permanent magnets on either side of this cover and so the idea is that by varying the current flowing through the coil it can cause the arm to move this part will move backwards and forwards, therefore, because this is the fulcrum, it will move the heads backwards and forwards. In fact, I can simulate that if I move, if I try and move that, that arm, you can see how it's moving across the disc, just like that. Now, when the drive is powered off, wherever the heads may be, they will automatically lock in position like this. They'll be moved into the, to their park position which coincides with the inner circumference of the platter. Now, let's suppose for a minute that for some reason the heads then got stuck in this position or the lever got stuck in this position. What will happen when you power the drive on is that it will spin the platter up and the heads then can't move. The heads get stuck in place. and. That does happen on some old SCSI hard disks. Now, the reason is due to the way the heads are parked. Now, if I just reposition this, try and get a close-up of the, the mechanism here, if the camera is going to maintain focus. No, no, it's not. Uh. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't want to focus. Hopefully you can see this. You can see that if I move the heads across the, across the platter, you see that the arm is moving as well. And if you look on the end here, we have a tiny magnet. And what that magnet does is that when the heads park, the lever moves into this, into this position, and this magnet is attracted to the, um, the housing here, and it keeps the heads locked in this position.
And when the drive starts up again, when the voice coil energizes, it will pull it will pull them apart. It's only magnetism that's keeping it locked in that position. So there's a tiny bit of resistance if I try and move it away from there. But on some drives I've, I've found that due to lack of use, this will actually get stuck in this position. There will actually be a... It will basically stick between the housing and this pin they'll stick together. And even the voice coil, when it's operating, can't exert enough force to overcome that. So what will happen is that even though the heads aren't stuck to the platter, the head mechanism is stuck in its park position. So it's made worse on some drives by the fact that in order to cushion the sound of the head's parking, you may have actually heard this in fact, when you turn an old drive off you may hear a, a clunk sound. And that clunk sound you hear is the head's being forced back in this position like that. There we go. Now, what some manufacturers did to try and cushion that sound is they actually put a rubber bumper on the end of the park mechanism. In other words, when the head's moved into the park position, Rather than having metal-to-metal -metal contact, as we have here, there was rubber-to-metal contact, which made the drive a lot quieter when it was being powered off. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, the rubber that was used, over time, will degrade and become very sticky. So what will happen is that the rubber will cause the park, um, or the, the lever here, to stick to the housing, which means the heads are basically stuck in their park position. Now, on a drive like this, where it's nothing more than a metal magnet contacting a metal surface, there's, there's almost no chance of that happening. But on one particular model of drive, which I'll show you now, it's a big, big problem. Okay, this is the drive I'm talking about. This is a Quantum Pro Drive ELS. This is an 80 megabyte drive that was used in many Macintosh models in the early 1990s. In fact, this one has a date, EP-ROM date of 1992 and I think this drive came out of a uh, I think it actually could have been an LC 475 um, or maybe an LC 3 but these drives were used extensively by Apple and due to a particular quirk in the way the parking mechanism was designed on these drives they have a major problem with the head mechanism sticking in the park position so before I take this apart, because the only way to fix this is to take the drive apart, before I do that though, I'll show you on my other drive what I mean. So as I mentioned before, this drive uses a park lock mechanism which involves, which, which consists of, oh, that's about as far as we can go, which consists of a small magnet here that is attracted to the housing here. So when the drive is parked, when the heads are parked, they're locked in position. And only the force of the voice coil can actually overcome that magnetic attraction. Now that works fine. Now, unfortunately, what Quantum did in the ProDrive ELS series, they did not, well, they, they had a, whoops, whoops. <laughs> They had a park... <laughs> Stay. They used a park lock mechanism which consisted of a, a plastic lever which came down from here and locked the head mechanism this way. There was basically a small, um, a small plastic blade that was, that was forced out by the air pressure of the drive and it was spinning. And when that happened, it moved a lever and interlock out of the way and allowed the heads to move. That part was fine. But in an attempt to cushion the sound of the drive, whoops, in an, <laughs> in an attempt to cushion the sound of the drive when it was parking to prevent that metallic clink when the drive's turned off, they put a rubber stopper that the head mechanism contacted when it parked. And that rubber bumper also served as the as the, the end stop or the limiter 
which prevented the heads from actually moving too far inwards and contacting the inner ring. So that bumper, um, as I said, served two purposes. It quietened the park sound and it also was the end stop for the movement of the head mechanism. And in this drive, the limiting um, or the end stop is actually this, the, this magnet here. So when it contacts the housing, it physically can't move any further. So therefore the heads can't move any closer to the center of the drive. Now that would have been fine for quantum, except they did not foresee what would happen to the rubber that that stopper was made from. Because as I've mentioned, um, in certain um, applications, rubber that was used on electronic components over time turns into a very, very sticky mush. And that's the problem that the quantum drives had, in that when the heads contacted the rubber bumper, they would stick to it. In fact, well, the problem was twofold. The first issue was the heads would then stick to that rubber bumper, which meant that when the drive spun up and the voice call tried to move the heads, it couldn't because the entire assembly was stuck to that rubber bumper in the park position. But the other problem was even worse in that the rubber bumper, as I mentioned, acted as the end stop to limit the movement of the head assembly. What would happen is that as the rubber degraded and turned into that, um, into that, that, that um, sticky mush, it also meant that it started to collapse, which meant that as the, as the heads parked, they moved too far inwards because the rubber bumper was no longer as wide as it should have been. And that meant that the heads moved out of the area where the drive could actually sense their position. And so what would happen is the drive could not in fact stabilize the rotational speed of the platters because it was looking for information from the drive's embedded servo track, it was looking for information being passed through the heads to fix the drive's rotational speed. And because the heads were out of position, they were in an area of the platters which had, did not have that information. So the drive could not even power up, even if it could free the heads. So it was a big problem. Now you may be thinking, well that's fine, we'll just change the rubber bumper, um, clean it off, put a new rubber bumper on there and all will be well. Well, that would be fine, except for reasons that are unbeknown to me, Quantum did not locate the rubber bumper within the actual head mechanism. Normally you'd expect the bumper to be somewhere here, as it is on this drive, so that as the heads move into the park position, they contact the rubber bumper or the stopper, and they, they, um, they're, they're basically in the park position. But no, Quantum put the rubber stopper underneath the platter assembly. They put it approximately here, underneath the platters, so that the arm, the bottom um, arm of the head assembly would contact the rubber stopper and prevent the heads from, from moving. Now what that means is in order to fix one of these drives that has this problem, you have to disassemble the entire drive, take the platters out, then replace the rubber stopper, put the platters back in, and, well, hope, hope that you've done it all correctly. <laughs> so it's quite an involved procedure. And, um, but thankfully it's one that, you know, if you have the nerve, you can do successfully. And I've done it on a few occasions to rescue these old quantum drives. And this drive, in fact, has, I believe, has the very problem that I've just described. So we're going to go through the process of actually taking this drive apart, taking the platters out, and changing that rubber stopper. And hopefully we can restore this drive back to working order. Now, again, as I've mentioned, I don't advocate taking hard disks apart because normally when you do that, um, they will, well, the chances of them working afterwards are quite slim. But in an old Apple Macintosh that you're fooling around with, it would make sense for a drive like this, which is very hard to get hold of, in fact, 
it's worth a try. If the drive doesn't work, you've got nothing to lose at this point. So let's look at the third issue you may encounter with old um, hard disks, whereby you have a hard disk that will power on, you'll hear it do its self-test, the heads will move back and forth, but the Mac will not recognise it. Now, if it's a question of the Macintosh not booting off the drive, then it may just need to be reformatted. So obviously you'd go into a program like um, Drive Setup or HDSC Utility and see if the drive can be partitioned and formatted. Now, if the drive can't even be recognised by those programs, you need to check things such as the SCSI cabling, the ID and the termination. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the idea with SCSI, as I mentioned, the, well, one, of the, one of the advantages of it is that you can have up to a, a, about, well, it's actually 15 devices on a single SCSI bus. I think it's 16, but the SCSI controller takes one of the IDs for itself. And so every device on a SCSI bus must have its, a unique SCSI ID between 0 and 15. Now, on most hard disks, the SCSI ID is set to 0 because what the Mac will normally do is it will, it will look for a SCSI device to start up from, starting at zero and then working its way up. So normally it's set to zero, and the Macintosh itself is normally ID number seven. But if, for example, you have a drive that is set to an ID of seven, it will conflict with the ID of the controller, and the controller will not be able to see the drive. So normally you'd set the ID to zero for a hard disk, and if you happen to have a Mac that has more than one disk in it, or if it has more than one SCSI device connected to it, you have to make sure that every single device has a unique SCSI ID. Now on these hard disks, you normally set them through jumpers on the back on the controller board, and I'll show that in a moment. But you also have to make sure that the bus is what we call terminated at each end. The idea is that in a SCSI chain, you have one device at one end and one device at the other end. Now normally, on most Macintosh models, the drive is the only SCSI device in the system. Therefore, the bus must be terminated at that end, and the other end, which is the controller, must also be terminated. And that way, the electrical signals can flow across the bus without any um, issue of, of interference or, um, or crosstalk. Now, to set termination on these older drives, you normally have what are called terminating resistors, which are plugged into the back of the drive or plugged into the controller board. So let me show you what I mean. Okay, well, we'll start with this Quantum Pro Drive ELS. If I turn the drive around, we've got the controller board on the back. And if I try and zoom in, hopefully it will stay in focus. No, it won't. Oh, there we go. You can see that we have these two resistor packs here and here. Just zoom out so it'll actually focus for me. Here and here. These are the termination resistors and basically for any drive in the system that is at the end of the SCSI bus you have to make sure these terminators are actually installed um, and they're installed correctly because if we look, if it's going to, hopefully it's going to show up on the camera. If I zoom, no, I won't let me zoom in. Let me try and get a bit closer here. Actually, these don't, these do have it in fact. See if I can show this. No, it isn't going to focus. But basically, at the end of each resistor, there is a dot printed on it which has to line up with a mark on the actual board. So, in fact, if I take one of these out, I'll show you what I I'll show you what I mean. So if I pull this one out, try not to bend the bend the pins. Oops, let's just see what I'm doing. Be very careful, it's it's one single Oop, unit there. <laughs> There's actually a, a there is actually a dot printed on the end of the resistor pack. Oops, there it. Oh, 
I don't know if it's going to show. It's a bit hard to see it. Let me try and get a bit... Let's see if it'll show. If you can see the dot on the far left-hand side of the, of the resistor pack, that has to mate with the pin or the socket here with the square around it. So in other words, you have to make sure you don't install these back to front. And the other thing, of course, is the SCSI ID that I was talking about before. And on this drive, you set it with these jumpers here, A0, A1 and A2. And in this position where none of the jumpers are set, that defaults to an ID of zero, which is what you normally want. But in any case, check with the drive manufacturer, check the specs online to see how yours is configured. So another one here, an old Rodime stepper motor drive. I think this came out of an old Macintosh SE. And this one is actually very similar. On the back, we have the termination resistors, except this time there are three of them rather than two. So they all have to be installed. And then the jumpers to set the ID are located, uh, where are they located on this one? Um, I think, that's such a good question, where are they located? Um, I don't actually see them on here. Oh, it'd be, this, it'd be these at the back, I would say. I presume they're here. These, are, these pins, whoops, can't even see what I'm doing. These pins here will, would be for the SCSI ID. So again, you'd have A0, A1 and A2. I think it's not marked on the board. No, it's not. But they would be used to set the ID. And in this case, again, because none of them are connected, the ID would be set to zero. So in the next video, I'm going to take this drive apart and we'll see if we can restore it back to working order. So thank you for watching part one of the, well, not part one, but uh, the first um, video in the series on, um, on fixing old hard disks. <laughs> and uh, stay tuned for part two, which will be the disassembly of this drive. And hopefully I can get it working again. Now, in all the time I've been working with, no, uh, <clears throat> now, of course, if you've been around old Apple Macs, you know what SCSI is. It's basically a system, it's basically, it, uh, getting ahead of yourself again. Now, if you've been around, but, blah, damn it. Now, if you've been around, God, I've done it again. <laughs> God. From the very first Macintosh to use a hut, no, um, ever since they basically, do, the, 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 the fact is that SCSI, now for, 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 if you have an old Macintosh, I think you can get serial, no, not serial, is to use a serial, why do I keep saying serial? And that rubber stopper also served as the, um, as the, as, as the, as the what? Ugh.